Hey everybody, welcome to today's video. So uh, I want to start off by saying I'm super excited. Uh, last night, my wife gave me my Christmas present early because she was just too excited for me to have it. And uh, she bought me a shotgun mic attachment for an audio recorder that I use to do uh, short films and my movie making and um, just a few other random things here and there. And I wanted one. It's I don't really care about Christmas. Christmas has never been a great time of year for me. But um, I was demanded that I make a Christmas list. It was on the top of my list. I got it. Super, super happy about it. Um, my plan had been to hook it up uh, as a direct input into the uh, DSLR our camera that we have. But unfortunately, our camera um, is not high quality enough or high level enough and does not have a mic jack. So um, I'm basically going to have to start learning how to sync sound and video, which I've never had to do before in our um, movies and short films and stuff like that. I've never done any of the editing, so I don't have any experience with that, but that's fine. That's kind of the whole point, as we know. Uh, just get out there, learn something, do something, improve my skills. So I'm super excited about that. I'm going to have two weeks off here. Uh, I work till Friday and then I don't go back until the first week of January. So that's going to be great. I'm going to have time to uh, screw around with some video making stuff, some audio recording stuff, and hopefully I can get to a point where by next year uh, I'll have a nice camera set up and audio set up instead of just doing this on my cell phone, which I think has worked just fine. Cell phones are quite capable these days of doing lots of different things. So yes, super excited about that. But that's not what today's video is about. Today's video is about the time that I basically got real lucky and was really stubborn and avoided falling into a cult. Yeah. So, little backstory on this. Uh, I've never shied away from my mental illness, my, uh, my past as a terrible, terrible child. Um, so, basically... The summer between 7th and 8th grade, my mom was at her wit's end with what to do with me. Um, I just would not listen. I was running away from home. I was fighting. I was smoking. I was just doing all kinds of, you know, delinquent things that uh, she just couldn't control anymore. And she tried. My mom, bless her soul, has always tried to do her best for me to find out a way to help me to not be what I was. And I don't fault her for this story at all. She was doing the best she could. Um, I talked to her about it earlier today. And she said that, you know, at the time it was the late 90s, probably 98, 99, somewhere in there. I can't really remember the exact year. But um, she knew something had to be done. She couldn't control me. Um, I just would not listen. I was defiant in every way. And she was desperate to find anything that she thought could possibly help me <clears throat> to mature and grow as a person. So she was online. She found this place. And on paper, it looked amazing. Um, you know, she, it didn't cost an arm and a leg, which a lot of facilities and schools do. Um, they would accept me despite my... Um, elopement risks and things like that, which is another thing that a lot of places back then didn't really do. Um, they didn't want to have to deal with runaways, stuff like that. So she found this place and that summer, I remember it distinctly. Um, it's the year that uh, the movie Armageddon came out and on my birthday, I went to a movie theater. I think we were in Cleveland, something like that on our way to New York. And we saw the movie Armageddon, and I got to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then the next day, I was dropped off at Freedom Academy, a.k.a. Freedom Village. I don't even remember what it goes by. It doesn't go by anything anymore because as of last year, it is defunct. They went bankrupt. He tried moving to uh, South Carolina. It didn't end up working out, which is good. So let me just tell you a little bit about this place. Um, as I said, I believe it was basically a fundamentalist Christian cult. Um, it was a cult of personality built around uh, the founder of the school, a man named Pastor Brothers, who, despite having no training, no credentials at all, 
was running basically a reform school. Uh, he has admitted under, you know, uh, oath and in depositions that, yes, he took psychology classes, but he deliberately tried to forget all about them because all you really need to change a life is God. You don't need medication. You don't need therapy. You don't need to address deep-seated trauma. No, just prayer and good, hard discipline. Um, that's all you need to change lives. And I'm sure there are kids that went to this program and it helped them. I, I don't know if anyone that I met when I was there would have come out changed for the better or if they just became indoctrinated into what school was presenting itself as. So, like I said, it was, it was a boarding school upstate New York on the banks of Seneca Lake. So the way that it was set up is there were two dormitories. There was a male and female dormitory. Um, they had a barn, a horse barn, um, lots of property, a chapel building, a couple of properties off campus that they owned, some warehouse space, stuff like that. So firstly, let's start with like the school aspect of it because it's, for all intents and purposes, a school. Uh, it used a system called ACE which is a system that is commonly used in um, Christian evangelical homeschooling. It's a PACE packet. And basically, um, you know, certain amount of packets equals a class. I don't remember. I went there in the summer, so I hadn't started school by the time that I left. Um, but they're like, you know, you can graduate you're coming here in eighth grade, you can be done with high school in, you know, two or three years. Wouldn't that be great? And me hating school was like, oh, yes, absolutely. Sign me up. I'm gung-ho for not having to go to school. What they don't tell you is they were unaccredited, completely unaccredited as far as the educational part side of it went. And for most, most probably all of it. Um, so what happens is these kids would go here. They would work super hard thinking they're, you know, getting their education. They're going to be ready to go sooner than they would if they stayed out in the world and they graduate. And most likely they're going to stay at school because um, that's just the culture that it grew up around itself was, you know, you graduate from here, you go through this program, it changes your life. You're going to become staff. Um, you know, they're like, you know, you don't want to go out into the world. You can't go out into the world. Like, that's just terrible. You're going to be defying the will of God if you leave these grounds. Um, but I think there was a reason for that. I think looking back on it, knowing what I know, read after reading what I've read that, like I said, they were not accredited. So you could graduate through their program. And if you left and tried to pursue higher education or anything like that, you didn't even have a diploma. You didn't even have a GED. So their way of being like, oh, we can keep that from getting out is, okay, well, we're going to indoctrinate you to where this is your life now. You graduate through our program, you stay on, you become part of uh, the staff, and you're never going to go out in the world and know that your education is meaningless and basically serves no purpose. And that's absolutely what they did. There were people there that were staff in charge of me and other students that had graduated from the program and they stayed on and this was their life now. It was just feeding into itself. Um, and like, I, so that is something that just drives me nuts because I hated school. I absolutely hated school. I am rather intelligent, um, but like school just doesn't work for some people. So they sold me on the idea of, oh, you know, you work at your own pace. You're going to get here. You're going to be fine. You're going to graduate. Um, I'm glad I didn't go through that. I'm glad I didn't stay there until I was 23 or whatever the age is that you can leave um, or you can stay in the program to because I would have been completely lost. There was no life skills development. There was none of that. Um, again, the pastor has prided himself on saying like, oh, you know, there are people that have they stayed here and they worked here for 30 years and 
they never had to buy a loaf of bread or have to pay a bill because they just lived on our property and we paid, you know, them and yeah, you paid them. You paid them below minimum wage. Some people were making less than $150 a week. That's not okay. And like, yeah, you can be like, well, we offset that with room and board and food, but you also didn't prepare people for life, what really exists outside your boundaries. So now let me get on to the religious side of it. Um, I think they kind of weave together. So, um, as I said, fundamentalist Christian. Racist, fundamentalist, hypocrites, I would say. Um, I've read stuff that, you know, years and years and years ago, he would rail against divorce until one of his biggest donors got a divorce and suddenly divorce was okay. Or women cannot wear pants. They must wear dresses. That's common in a lot of denominations, whatever. But as soon as a donor or his own wife decided, you know what, I'm going to wear pants, suddenly pants on women are okay. But only if you're an adult, not if you're a child or a teenager. Um, he, the racism part. There were so many times in chapel, which we had to go to at least twice a day, where he would just go on and on and on about be not unequally yoked. Um, a lot of people will interpret this scripture as meaning, as a believer, do not marry an unbeliever. Um, his was, white people should marry white people, should never marry a black person, a Mexican person, Asian, no race mixing whatsoever, racist. Um, I remember him going on about how great the Confederate flag was and everything that it stood for. We had several Korean kids um, in the dorm who I remember just being constantly talked down to, berated, um, just abused outright, and for no reason other than they were Korean. Um, and that broke my heart. Um, that It's kind of hard to talk about this stuff when I really start getting into it and talking about it, because I was only there for a month, but that month was so profoundly disturbing and just it did so much damage to me that I can't imagine what it did to people who were there for longer and I know that I am super lucky that I got out um anyways more about the religious aspect of it so like I said we would be in chapel multiple times a day um Girls and women on one side, men and boys on the other. Uh, you're not allowed to have any connection unless the pastor sets you up. Unless you're in pastor's choice or pastor's club, whatever it was. And then it was basically this weird little matchmaking thing where they're like, well, you can hang out with this person because our goal is to get you to stay here. So you're going to associate with this girl or boy or whatever that is in the program as well, and then you're going to graduate from the program together, and then you're going to get married, and then you're going to stay in the program, and you're going to be the next generation of staff. That's definitely how that was. Um, but he would just twist so many things to justify what he was doing, the things he was saying, how he was acting, and it. I had grown up going to church, and um, an evangelical church, and I even I knew that I recognize that there are problems within Christianity. I think that Christendom, the joining of the church and state under Constantine, was a terrible, terrible thing. And I know that terrible, terrible things have been done in the name of God. And I disavow that. I disavow those terrible, terrible things. Um, but basically, I, at that age, even knew that, like, you're twisting scripture to justify your racism, your homophobia, your nationalism, all that stuff. It was just terrible. So, you know, we'd have chapel multiple times a day. He'd get up there and preach about whatever nonsense. He, he was always very political with it. Um, I remember that one day we had a special speaker who was some, you know, spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton. 
or something along those lines. I don't really remember. It's not important. Um, but then the discipline would come in. So in the middle of chapel, they would call you out individually for any minor infraction you may have had. You didn't eat your whole plate of moldy, you know, food. Well, you're on woodpile. Now, okay, what's woodpile? Um, so take a, you know, standard size basketball court. Put a giant pile of chopped firewood at one end of it. Carry three pieces at a time to the other end until every piece from this pile is now down there. And then just do it over again. Sometimes you'd get it for like two hours, depending on what you did. Sometimes it'd be two, sometimes it'd be four. Uh, there were kids that were out there for eight hours a day. I was out there for eight hours a day a couple times because I just was not buying into all of it. Um, it's... And I think that's how I, that's how I got out. They could tell that I was not buying into the whole system and they got rid of me pretty quick. But I haven't talked about one of the most troubling parts of it yet. I'm sorry, this video is kind of all over the place because it's kind of me like processing and dealing with what went on there. So I said, you know, they liked keeping staff their people that had been in the program, they liked keeping them in. And there were very specific ways they did this. I distinctly remember hearing multiple times in chapel or just in conversation that, well, if you leave here, you are leaving God's will. You're going to go out there and you're going to get AIDS. You're going to go out there and you're going to fall into violence and you will be murdered if you leave these grounds. This is the only place you're safe. God protects us here. Don't you know that? You can't go out into the world. The world is a bad, bad, evil place. And we are the only ones that are good. As long as you are on our campus, the Lord will save you. But if you leave, you will face his wrath and you will burn in hell. That's literally what it was. And to a lot of young, impressionable, mentally ill people, that's enough. That's enough to get them sucked right into it. They're like, oh, I found this place of belonging. I found this place that makes me feel safe and secure. You know, I've dealt with all this trauma out in the world and abuse, but in here I'm safe. No. I, I from day one, wasn't buying that. I had been in the world enough to know, yeah, there's bad in the world. There's terrible, terrible stuff in the world. But there was terrible stuff in that place as well. There was abuse. Um, there, I mean, I've, I've talked about some of it. Like force feeding kids to eat like literally rotten food. Um, one of my jobs, because we would have jobs that we had to do around the campus. One day I had um, to clean the kitchen. And I was cleaning out like the meat grinders and like the food processors it's just maggots and cockroaches everywhere. And that was like what they were feeding us. Um, they tried at all costs to use child labor for all the projects around. Um, I, you know, I saw kids not being trained in how to do it, having to use like forklifts and, you know, stuff like that, which, yeah, that can be fun if you're screwing around. But like, this was like, like I said, it was literally child labor. And I'm just not okay with it. Not okay with any of what happened in that place. I'm so glad that I didn't buy into it. I'm so glad that I had parents who, once they realized what was going on, helped me get out of there. So I don't even remember how exactly I got finally kicked out, but it had been a long series of me doing wood pile doing various other things like no level, which is you basically just sit in a room all day, eight hours a day, listening to whatever random music was somehow approved and the only thing that God would allow. And uh, one day I just, I lost it. Um, I started going off about how, you know, this is slave labor. This is not right. 
you are psychologically abusing kids here. And they're like, do you not want to be here? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. And they're like, okay, you're gone. They, I think in that instance, knew that I wasn't going to swallow the Kool-Aid. I wasn't going to take what they were offering. And they needed to get me and other people like me out of there because we would, you know, our ideas could fester and infect the rest of the believers or whatever. Um, so they called my parents and I was maybe 13 or 14. And they're like, we're taking him to New York City. We're going to put him on a bus and we're dropping him off at like 1130 at night and have fun. He'll hopefully get home. Uh, again, I'm a little kid for, for all intents, intents and purposes from the Midwest. And that was their plan to get rid of me. Um, luckily, my parents were like, no, you're not doing that. We're going to come get him. And they did. And I'm grateful for that because I don't know. I If I had gone to New York at that age, I probably wouldn't have come back. And if I did, I wouldn't be in the shape I am, you know, but that place was, it was dangerous and it lasted for years and years and years. And I can only imagine, I've read some of the stories from people that were there that had it so much worse than I did because I didn't allow myself to fall into the whole trap. I didn't allow myself to buy into the nonsense that they were spewing um there are lots of you know, allegations of sexual abuse uh physical abuse um i know like i said psychological abuse like medical abuse there wasn't a doctor there there wasn't a real anything there like if you were on medication and you got sent there they would take you off that medication immediately and there were kids there that had like legitimate like psychoses that their lives were extremely negatively impacted by not being on medication. But again, you don't need medication. Medication and psychology and psychiatry, it's all of the devil. And the God up there is going to save everyone. If you're just, you just believe hard enough, you're going to be healed. You just, you know, join our club and you're going to be just fine. Otherwise, have fun getting AIDS, have fun getting murdered. It's such a crock. But yeah, I've seen today I was doing a lot of reading that there are people that came out of that place much worse than when they went in. And I believe it. I a hundred percent believe it. Again, I got lucky. They just from the start knew that I wasn't going to buy into it and they couldn't have that. I think that's the only reason why I survived, why I got out when I did. And it's heartbreaking. Um, I can't remember if I said this at the beginning of the video, cause I've been rambling for almost 25 minutes now. Um, yeah, they no longer exist. Uh, last year they closed down. Uh, I think he had had plans to move everything to, um, South Carolina. A bunch of petitions were started. Um, people started coming out of the woodwork that had been patients and staff and students there that, you know, raised raise some noise about it. And I think South Carolina just denied them the permits or whatever it was, which is good. Um, as far as I know, he now is in Florida running a podcast, asking for donations. Um, charlatan, hundred percent charlatan. And, um, I just hope that there are people that went there that suffered, that can find some peace knowing that he's gone now, like, He's not gone. He's still there. But knowing that that place is no longer there, that those memories, we're always going to have them, but they're not, it's not like you can go back to that place anymore. It's, it's gone. It was sold off. Um, and good, good riddance. I, uh, there was so much that about what happened there that I didn't even talk about because I, I, like I said, like I was kind of just rambling and processing things. Um, but yeah, like maybe I'll talk more about it if anybody wants to. I mean, I'm I'm going to be open about it if people want to know more um, about like 
I know that at one of the warehouses, I will say this. I know that they had a warehouse um, that they got paid by some company. I don't know how it worked, but they were like old, unused, expired dialysis bags. And they were hired by some company to like break down the boxes and like drain the bag. I don't even remember. Honestly, it was probably all lie, whatever they told us we were doing. Um, but I remember just working in a hot warehouse with like 20 other kids for like five hours in the middle of July. Um, just like cutting open these bags and letting the fluid drain out. They looked like IV bags almost, but I don't know what they were. I don't know what the point of it was. I don't know what weird deal they had with somebody, but they must have had something. But um, yeah, I... Uh, That was a weird time in my life. <laughs> One of the many weird times in my life. And uh, I'm sorry this video is so long today. Uh, I just kind of had to get that out and talk about it and put it out in the world. And, you know, if you've got any questions, like I said, I'm more than willing to answer them. I'm more than willing to talk about it. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to end the video there because uh, this is incredibly long. I'm, I apologize. I doubt any of you are even going to watch to the end, but if you did, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll come back with something a little more lighthearted tomorrow, hopefully. So let's end with our quote, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Throughout your life, advance daily, becoming more skillful than yesterday, more skillful than today. This is never ending. See you guys.